So, hello and welcome to the CMIP Panel Debate Theatre here at NAB Show 2022. We have an all-star panel to talk about lessons learned from the pandemic. So to kick it off, let's get our panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Javier. Hello, my name is Javier Reyes Gomez. I'm uh, Head of Contribution Strategy for Appear. Um, yep. So my name's Todd Scott. I lead our collaboration business for service provider, which also includes media for Cisco Systems. Um, so I'll hand it over to Larry. I'm Larry Thaler. I'm the CEO of VCC. Uh, we are uh, a vendor that provides solutions for remote production, specifically from smartphones and laptops. And I'm uh, Mike Sid, Chief Strategy Officer and co-founder of uh, WIP Media. We have a combination of cloud-based workflow solution products and uh, first-party data television engagement products. I think we're all glad to be back in Vegas <laughs> with humans, wearing trousers, you know. It's a great experience. And, I, and I'm not going to denigrate the pandemic. It was a hard time for all of us. Um, people lost. But we have learned things during what has been a trying couple of years. Javier, are there any trends or surprises or emerging activities that the pandemic has highlighted for you? Yeah, so um, um, uh, we uh, have seen that remote production uh, has uh, really gone from uh, a technology to explore something that uh, some people had deployed, but it was a bit of a experimental thing or something that only used niche to uh, need something that it has to be done to to be able to produce content especially with people sitting at home uh, bored <laughs> finding something to watch on TV so then you this pr production has to be done with all the limitations that the pandemic um, uh, brought uh, so so then um, certain technologies that were there but maybe they were not that experimented and tested uh, were immediately taken and brought into the, the systems and they found out that ah it works actually. So uh, yeah, that's, that's been uh, one of the learnings of the pandemic, at least in the area of the industry where we, we work. We completely agree, Todd. Yeah, so I think similar to what Javier mentioned, uh, Cisco's obviously been a pioneer in the hybrid work environment for some time. Uh, for us during the pandemic, it was really nothing new from you know our personal uh, employees. But what we wanted to do was share that with our customers. And as Javier mentioned, you know, we found use cases that we didn't even know existed, uh, particularly in the media space, by leveraging some of our technologies like WebEx, like our WebEx devices, uh, purpose-built devices for video conferencing. So when we were talking about OTT and the huge demand, uh, I think all of us can probably raise our hand and say during a period of time, whether or not we had our kids at home streaming Netflix nonstop, or we had them doing remote learning. Um, you know, we all saw, you know, stresses on our networks and we're competing for uh, that given bandwidth. And so, you know, we really looked at, you know, we had to look at ourselves and say, how do we improve our products? How do we um, allow more people to engage using video conferencing for other use cases across multiple industries, including the media space? So, you know, we were proud at Cisco to say we already had a product on the market. We just made some tweaks to make it better for remote production and other types of use cases that we saw during the pandemic. When I spoke to Larry a, a few years back, you were talking about mobile being the next big thing. Who knew a global pandemic was going to turn <laughs> up? Uh, it's, it's like you knew, Larry. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're sitting here at the Connected Media Pavilion, and you know, 90% of the booths here think of this as a consumption device. And we've been talking about it as a contribution device for the past seven years. Um, and what's really kind of neat about um, what happened with the pandemic is people who would never put Teams on the air started putting Teams and Skype and other conferencing apps on the air. And uh, that, you know, any, any, harb any port in a storm, I think that's the expression, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and what happened was over time, those grew and they grew and they grew and they grew. And the pandemic might be manageable now, but the need for IP remotes has not gone away. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is those processes need to get to place that's going to be mature, mm -hmm. that they can fit into their operations, that the quality will be improved, and that their teams won't be using kind of jury-rigged kind of solutions. And that's where we come in, because we've been, this is what we've been doing for such a long yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, and Mike, I, mean, I know we've, we were always going to go to Remy as like a go-to, but Mike, I mean, it's not just been about remote production, has it? Oh, no, actually, I think if you take a look at a, 
what's been fascinating for me about sort of the impact of the pandemic has been kind of the cascade you know, of sort of, uh, you know, sort of immediate workflow things within our industry and how that's affected things, you know, uh, in, a, in a larger sense. Because everybody, of course, when the lockdowns came, was driven to watch the streaming services, was driven to watch things, you know, on television. But production shut down. So eventually, you kind of get through all that stuff after month one of the pandemic, and then what happens, right? You know, now, because there's no, you know, more production, production's kind of shut down, the pipeline's closed, and you know, all of a sudden there's this mad frenzy to acquire finished content. There's this mad frenzy to create fast channels, AVOD services, and just have a lot more content out there. So I think you see this, this crazy sort of acceleration of the ecosystem that just sort of happened, you know, like a, you know, a year's uh, pandemic equals 10 years of acceleration of different business models. And I think that's been kind of fantastic. And then trying to do business at that faster pace as you know, we as all of you guys have been involved in that, you know, that changes everything, not just in remote production, but how we work, you know, not just with our own companies, but with other companies. Because you, you're trying to do this, you need to collaborate, you need to, sell, you need to sell products, you need to buy products. How do you do all that? I, 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 we can't avoid remote production. The, the growth of remote production was just like nothing I've ever seen. In the UK, we had shows that were, that had gone from studio based to studio based with contributors via Zoom to completely remote. It was, it was stunning, but there were challenges. I mean, Xavier, are there any sort of moments where you thought, wow, how do we get over this challenge now? Yeah, so uh, and <coughs> we've, we've uh, seen that, um, uh, as I say, it's that there were certain technologies that were out there, um, but uh, since um, uh, the, the production companies, service providers had not done that move or that transition, that adoption of those mm -hmm. technologies, I think there was a moment of uh, a bit of sh shaky feeling mm -hmm. of uh, what's going to happen. We have to solve it. Uh, and, and, uh, and then the, the learning or the, the positive thing is that, uh, for example, I can give you an example of using uh, contribution of content or sending the content from a stadium to a studio mm -hmm. uh, over the internet using, using technologies like SRT and how much that has gone from a niche, I'm not so sure if I should use, use this, to let's go all in for it. Now we don't talk about anything else. Yeah. It's one of the technologies that is really and there. And scale as well. SRT for the occasional tier two type environment, but SRT as a mission critical scalable environment was, was a real groundbreaking moment. It is, it is. The connectivity had to change. I mean, you guys, very well known both in the broadcast space and networking space, but I'm guessing you now had organizations that had to massively scale out very quickly. Yeah, I mean, I mean we saw that. We saw that, uh, you know, I could speak from the collaboration perspective. Um, obviously, we were uh, at a point where we could scale to meet demand. I mean, we saw overnight that WebEx video traffic doubled, tripled in some cases, depending on the area of the globe. Um, and so from a remote production perspective, again, people were trying to figure out what do we do? How do we bring teams together? How do we, you know, we, we normally have people that are sitting in a studio or sitting on a lot or in a production facility that are now, you know, doing work from home. And again, we were very familiar and very comfortable with that, that mode of work uh, being Cisco. And so, you know, we took WebEx and we had our challenges, right? Because we had some people that were taking video streams from WebEx where maybe the quality wasn't exactly what they wanted to put on air or what they wanted to uh, use in a production. Or maybe they looked and said, well, there's icons on the bottom of the screen. Why do my viewers want to see a, a mute button? Or <laughs> why do they care that there's 15 participants on this yeah. call, right? So, you know, it challenged us to make sure that we gave those types of controls back to our users and back to the, uh, our administrators that are helping from a, uh, a potentially a corporate office to help manage some of that. Uh, more importantly, you know, our, our transition to SaaS is one thing, but we still do have a healthy hardware business, even on the video conferencing front. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I brought one of our newest devices to the booth today to show that, you know, we can do the 4K quality and still use some of the uh, traditional hardware devices to accomplish that. And they're very portable today, very affordable as well. And so we saw that multiple examples from like, Ellen DeGeneres and the Jimmy Kimmel Show, and you guys have probably seen on CNN, powered by WebEx, right? There's a lot of examples where it was very successful, and it continues to be. It's interesting to see that there was lots of, of uh, talent who suddenly had broadcast studios 
in their back bedrooms. Mm -hmm. I think I watched a, a season of Jon Stewart from his attic while he, <laughs> he talked to a sea captain. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was a bit surreal. Yeah. Wait, Larry, you, I hate to say this, but you guys were a little bit prescient on this. Yeah. Were there any things that surprised you as well about the adoption of consumer devices in production workflows. Well, so, so th I mean, the interesting thing that people don't really real realize when they're trying to set up a remote from a smartphone is when you send out a remote with a crew, you have a crew at the end, and you have somebody setting up the phone. When you're setting it up with a smartphone, you don't have a crew. No. So who is your crew? It's the subject. <laughs> your subject, who may be their house just burned down, or they're a, uh, a refugee in Ukraine, right? Are they going to know the terms pan, tilt, zoom? Are they going to know how to l download an app on their phone? Well, so what we learned was that the key here is to make it really, really simple for them. We had a, we had a, a customer who um, started using Skype at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and, um, and this is a big news organization, and they do something approaching 25,000 feeds a year using the system, and they were getting buried by people who didn't know their Skype name or couldn't mm -hmm. figure out whether yeah. it was Skype for business or yeah. Skype. Um, and, they were, and, and the amount of time they were spending doing this, they brought us in, they saved more than 20 minutes on average per feed, and now they're doing, um, you know, 25,000 remotes on our platform. Wow. I, I, I always love customer stories because you all work with hundreds of customers, thousands of customers potentially. Mike, are there any examples that you think back to over the last couple of years where there was something innovative or a challenge that was overcome that, that sticks in the mind that you'd like to share? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, so during this, I, so ironically, um, you know, just immediately prior to the pandemic and lockdown, you know, we had strategically planned to build a new uh, virtual marketplace for content. So, <laughs> driven by data. And this is before the pandemic, before the lockdown. So our product development, you know, went on through that and then we had to go and launch it, you know, into the marketplace. So you would think, all right, you know, CAN is shut down, MIP is shut down, NAPI is shut down. This would be like the perfect time to launch a virtual marketplace for content where acquisition folks and content sales folks could kind of could kind of get together and uh, you know one of the big ironies that we had was that uh, you know obviously we were able to reach out to people and try to launch this remotely because it seemed you know very well into the times the the weird irony is that uh, the the most traction we got was when those shows like MIPCOM and uh, MIP TV started to open back again and we were able to actually attend those and meet with uh, hundreds of content buyers and sellers <laughs> and show them a way that they didn't, you know, that they could supplement what they were doing. That, that's where we actually began to get enormous amounts of traction. Ironic. Which, which is Ironic. an incredible, yes. uh, you know, irony, <laughs> irony in that. And I think what it hits at, right, is kind of what we're seeing here, right? You know, you, you, you can do all this, uh, I'm obviously remote production's a little different, but you can do all this sort of remote work, you know, in general, but there still needs to be some sort of human touch points because trust is what's established, you know, in person. You know, especially for new products and things like that. That's why people do launches, even remote trust, where people see you in a webcast or something like that, but see you amongst other people seeing it. It's a legitimization factor that, you know, is, is I mean, it's probably something primal, right? It's something that is just in us and, uh, you know, to, and how trust gets built. Well, Todd, Javi, are there any examples that you can share? And we have to change the names of the customers, I, I accept <laughs> that. That you can share that, that surprised you or innovate. Javi, any innovation yeah. surprises from customer perspective that shown yeah, through? I, I actually have a, um, a nice example of, uh, this, this was uh, a customer or, or project we are working on actually still today, today uh, for uh, eSports where uh, they uh, surprisingly have 35 different languages of wow. studios with commentators analyzing what's going on on 35. that 35. Wow. Um, so um, each studio is a, is a green screen virtual studio that requires all the uh, virtual graphics to be built uh, uh, there. So they showed me the video of the amount of racks, racks after racks after racks of equipment that had to be shipped to the location where the competition was happening to be able to generate all these languages yeah. or different shows mm -hmm. analyzing what's going on. Um, and here is where remote production kind of changes completely the, the landscape. So now we're, what we are working is on each 
country will have their green screen studio, will bring the content into a central place where you have your yeah. rack of servers to create all the graphics. Yeah. And then you're good to go and send it to the broadcast to the different countries around the world. And it, and it worked. And it worked. <laughs> Using the internet, by the way. <laughs> yeah. You know, Javier, you, you should have partnered with Cisco, right? So through WebEx, we have virtual backgrounds. We also have the real-time translation. Always be selling. <laughs> Always be selling. <laughs> um, to help with some of that. Um, no, I mean, I think, you know, for, from my perspective, again, I, I traditionally had focused on just general business use and reimagining what WebEx and our products and services could do. So, I mean, I think as we looked across and customers were challenging us and giving us, you know, these problems and we're having to solve these, I mean, that was the biggest lesson for me, right? And again, you know, we, we I think we all took it for granted that this remote work, this hybrid work, mm -hmm. um, how we, you know, partner and, and team together and, and accomplish things, you know, we saw just a plethora of different, you know, examples where it was challenging our technology to provide something different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's the biggest, thing for me in, in, you know, multiple examples, again, I mentioned a couple of them already, um, you know, more importantly, we wanted to make sure, and this is really where we're driving towards, which is to give everybody an inclusive feeling on any of our meetings, right? And, and so if you're a participant of WebEx, regardless if you're sitting in the audience like you are today, and we use some of our purpose-built devices that pick up everybody's individual faces, traditionally you would look and see an audience, right? Mm -hmm. And now we can actually take and frame that to an individual to bring mm -hmm. everybody in. You may be at home, you may be in a coffee yeah. shop, I may be calling you from a car, you may be part of the audience, but everybody now has an equal participation. And, and that, that ability to be seamless, particularly for organizations that are distributed, mm -hmm. is so incredibly important. Nobody wants to feel excluded because they're working from home or excluded because they're working from the office, right. which might be. I'm, I know you've got some examples of, well, of yeah, some customers. You, know, I, you were talking about innovation and, and tying to the seamless. Um, uh, one of our customers is the International Emmy Awards. And we did this uh, two years ago when it was full pandemic and we had 40 award winners that had to be brought in remotely onto their, onto their program to get their awards. Um, and these were in you know, uh, six different continents, 40 different countries, um, and we got them all on, and, and, and it was, they liked it so much, they brought us back the next year when they had a event in person here in New York, well not here in New York, there in New York, and, um, and it was a hybrid event. Some of the award winners still couldn't travel, but there was a room with 500 people in it that was packed with, yeah. with tables, and they needed a way to shoot the, the award winners who were in the room and the award winners were outside the room. And so what we did was we equipped four guys with these smartphones mm -hmm. and little stabilizer sticks and lights, mm -hmm. and they ran around the room <laughs> to, get the, to get the nominees, what they were all lined up, so you had the four of them on the screen, and then the winner would come forward. It was the exact same workflow for the control room, regardless of whether they were 3,000 yeah. or 6,000 miles away, or whether they were in the room. And, and really kind of innovative way of looking at remote production, even when it's local. That's a great example. Yeah. I think one of the, the other fundamental changes is not, and I'll, I'll steer away now from remote production, but around the business side of things. So there, there has been a trend in our industry over the last few years to move away from CapEx and towards OpEx, predominantly around cloud adoption. I'll take this to anybody who wants to answer it. Has that move towards an OpEx-centric model changed, accelerated during the pandemic? Has it rolled back slightly? I'm curious to see you sure. take that one. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's spot on. There's definitely been, a, you know, a shift from, you know, to, to, to more OpEx, to more SaaS-based models, to more, obviously, cloud-based models. I think one of the interesting things, too, is that, you know, for us, you know, we have, uh, one of our products is a, essentially an enterprise software product, and we, we implement, you know, in the past, it used to be a, you know, fairly heavy process. You'd fly the team in, everybody would sit together, you'd figure things out over the course of several days and then you'd you know go apart you know go on your merry ways and do things now because everything is remote there isn't sort of that big coming together or anything so it's it's not even just sort of like the you know the 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 financial model it's almost the way the work is done you're not working in that big blast of capex or that big blast of attention anymore it's just sort of disparate now when we do implementations and we're doing one right now remotely you just uh, it just goes as as you go i mean you come together in some Zoom sessions to get some basic principles, but then connection just happens so quickly. You need to get technology, you need to get the business teams on, 
it'll happen like immediately and it just happens constantly and I think work gets a lot done a lot better a lot more iteratively and a lot faster and I think that for me that's pretty exciting about how you kind of break down the barriers between parties to not just between inside companies but between companies and everybody just can work a lot more closely together and a lot more constantly and I think that's more fulfilling I, I Thank you. Um, I think um, the, the key thing when you're trying to get a customer to reframe themselves between CapEx and OpEx, um, you can't just make the OpEx system cost the same as the CapEx system spread over time. Okay. You actually have to get productivity out of it or nobody's going to sign up for it. That's a, it's a great, that's a great <laughs> point, yeah. So yeah, so maybe some folks have heard that there's some supply chain challenges, right? I, so I've heard, <laughs> heard a story. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously that forced a lot of us to reconsider you know, how we deployed and, and what type of solutions we were looking for. So what you were traditionally doing with hardware, we had to find examples where we could use software to replace that. Um, you know, you mentioned Zoom meetings, I'll mention the WebEx meetings. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, so I, I obviously I think, <clears throat> so not only the SaaS based model, but I think it's more around the consumption model, right? So people want to only use what they consume. I think you're, that's what you're trying to speak to. You're, you're utilizing what you need and I think that's where the model's driving towards. So it's one thing to adopt, you know, a licensing package or a software. Uh, it's another thing to figure out What's the run rate of how many of these licenses do we need or what's mm. the actual subscription base? So I think we're all having to re-challenge ourselves to how do people want to purchase from us? I think that's the bigger story. Have you seen a similar trend? Yeah, so um, it, it's, it's clear that there, there is a, a trend point into moving on onto an OPEX uh, model. Mm. Uh, however, something that we have also seen is that, um, for example, and of course I have to go back to remote production, okay? So <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when you are, moving into a an, an cloud-based remote production with real at-home production and your production happening in the cloud, the content still has to reach the cloud somehow. Yeah. And there is where pieces of hardware like the ones that we make <laughs> in Appear uh, are uh, still a key and, and really, really needed. So I don't think it is immediate that it's all OPEX or all CAPEX. Ano another thing we've seen is that uh, uh, companies that moved onto OPEX models uh, maybe because those business models were not really made for the purpose of that application, they are rolling back to CapEx and coming to us to, to, to change the, the, the approach. 100%, and you, I've had conversations where people have said, we moved X to the cloud, but we moved Y to a hybrid, and we're going to move A and B to the cloud, but we might move C to in-house. That fluidity, I think the pandemic is has made conversations about fluidity and agility more acceptable. There isn't a, a right way to do everything. Uh, Larry, you, you guys remember Trendsetter. Yeah, so so um, I, I think what the pandemic did was it, it, it caused people to have to innovate. Hmm. In order to survive, you have to innovate. And as soon as you get to a place like that, you are willing to take chances that you weren't willing to take before. Yeah. Um, th the trick now is to take that innovation that you had and find a way to get it to a mature state so that you can get the next level of innovation on top of it. You have to sometimes you know, take a step back uh, from the 10,000 10, foot view, take a look at what you did, yeah. and, then, uh, and then say, okay, this got us to where we are. Where do we need to be in a year? Where do we need to be in two years? And what kind of platform do we need in order to get to that? Like you've read my question list. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a bit about what the and I'm not, it's not a phrase that I love, but the new normal. What mm. we've learned and where we're going to be now. What is, NAB show is wonderful, it's great to be back. But what does the new normal look like over the next two to three years? Whoever wants to. Yeah, I think it's, like, I think it's kind of a funny thing, right? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, you know, amongst other things, you know, we all talk about, you know, oh, is your office going hybrid? Are you going two days a week, three days a week, one day a week? But, you know, as soon as you're not always there, you know, or most of the time there, you're in this model of sitting in your office on a WebEx. Yeah, you know, you see. <laughs> you one know, at a time. Just get customers <laughs> one at a time. There you go. <laughs> all, all, all day long. So, you know, you know how, how, what's the utility of that, right? You know, what becomes the utility of that? You know, what, what, do you, what is work like, you know, in person about at that point? And, you, you know. Do you get together once a week and everybody's just there once a week? You know, so it, it's, I don't think it's settled yet. I don't think yeah. people know what they're going to do. What does new normal look like? Um, so so I, I, I think that um, um, the industry 
has to get to a place where it's comfortable in its own shoes. The world is changing in terms of where production is going, how it's being distributed, yeah. and that means new methods for content creation. Remote production is here to stay, there's no question about Absolutely. that, and the question is um, getting that remote production to a place where your teams are being really, really highly efficient. And that's what we're doing at VCC. Um, we're, we're solving that problem. Um, and you know, you, you've mentioned WebEx a couple of times. I have to, I have to mention VCC. Um, um, and, um, and, and the truth of the matter is that um, the, the solutions that are available um, are not necessarily mature enough yet. And, uh, and, and I encourage everybody to look around and find what is going to work for their teams. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also, it's, you're right, it's not a one hat fits all. There are certain scenarios where solution A is perfect, solution B is just better for a particular customer or a scenario. Todd, I mean, what does the new normal look like from your perspective? Yeah, I, I think we're all still defining what that new normal is, mm. and I think to your point, we have to continue to innovate. And I think what we're looking for, just as an industry as a whole, is how do we cooperate together, right? And how do we learn from each other, and how do we build those deeper integrations to work together for yeah. you know, specific examples, use cases, what that may be. And so I think it's really challenged, especially in my collaboration, we mentioned Zoom a couple of times at WebEx, right? But you know, obviously com competing, but also working together to give the end users you know, the power to decide, it might be this platform today, it might be this platform tomorrow, we might be using this device. We all need to work well together because we understand there's not one platform or one solution that's going to be one size fit all for everybody. Absolutely. So I think it's, it's forcing us to work together and integrate together. And, and Xavier, we, remote production is here to stay. We're never going to go back to having to roll trucks to every single event. But what does remote production 2.0, 3.0, look like to you? Yeah, so we, we, we are clearly seeing a, a, a big push of the industry uh, to move on to cloud uh, workflows. Um, uh, so I think cloud production or remote production in the cloud maximizes the benefits of the remote production. Mm -hmm. You can get redundancy of talent. You can have your talent at home. Yeah. You can have the best talent. You can actually choose it. You, you can select your best talent where, wherever he sits you don't need to have it geographically in the place you're producing. So that is definitely uh, uh, something that we, we are seeing. And the other one is agreeing very well with Todd. I think the, 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 the industry is m shifting into a much more open, col collaborative um, approach within vendors that historically or in a different time would have been much more close to have your own end-to-end -end locked in solution and not a more open approach. And, and, and cus customers don't want lock-in anymore. Yes, they don't. So we are nearly out of time. We do have enough time for a, a few questions from the audience. There's a gentleman just there. We'll get you a microphone, sir. We'll just be one second. Thank you. Uh, this is for Todd and for Larry. Uh, your two organizations apparently handle the video remotes for two of the three major television news operations in the U.S. What during the pandemic were the problems and what did you learn and how did you provide solutions to those problems? Thank you. Great question. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to take that. I think the biggest challenge for us was we could only control a portion of that feed, right? And that's what was happening in the production facility. So as we brought remotes on, whether that was an anchor sitting in their house, whether that was somebody from the general public from the breaking news story, that bandwidth constraint became problematic, right? And so we had to look at our own application and figure out, could we compress that, right, to where we could still give a video feed at something that was high quality enough to put on air. I would say that's the biggest challenge. And again, we had to go back and look at WebEx as the platform uh, and the application to make sure that we could compress that enough, still give good quality video, but also be able to operate in the more low bandwidth environments. Um, I, you know, we, our customers had the same kind of experience um, and the, the issue was that you don't control the bandwidth or the device at the, at the end. You don't control the person, you don't control the bandwidth, you don't control the device, but you need to get a really good high quality signal back. How do you do that? Um, and so our customers were struggling with that and uh, in particular the news customer um, uh, were, were spending way too much time setting up those feeds. Um, and what our tools do is they actually go out, they query the bandwidth at the site, they query the device that's 
being used there, and they, they give the producer the opportunity to decide how we're going to connect before the connection is made. So even before that first conversation, you know whether I'm going to have a discussion about bandwidth and setup, or I'm going to write ready to go right to lighting and framing, um, and uh, and optimizing the solution to what the bandwidth is available is actually a really helpful thing. Okay. It's a great question, sir. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the floor? I have one last question, but if there's any more questions from the floor? So I have one final question for all of you. Um, hindsight is 2020. <laughs> I mean, it is. If you had to give a piece of advice that you've learned over the pandemic, and I say this praying it doesn't happen, but for the potential next incident that affects us on a global basis, I'll start with you, Mike, what would that one piece of advice be? Oh, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, you know, really that uh, you can't underestimate the, you know, what, what, what human contact gives you and you've got to find a way to replace it. And I think, you know, the way to replace infrequent human contact is just a lot more frequent web access. I mean, you just have to be, you know, just in, in contact and completely, you know, transparent to, to all your partners in the business and partners internally. And that's all you can do. Transparency is a great one. Larry. I, I, w I would say actually plan ahead. Um, so everybody, especially in the news business, um, but also in our sports and entertainment folks, everybody's focused on what they're doing today or in the next week or week after. Take a small amount of your bandwidth, spin it off into some innovation, some stuff that's next generation <coughs> that may not affect air today, but will set you up should there be another pandemic, should be, be something, God, God forbid, worse than yeah. what we just experienced. Um, uh, take, take a little bit of resources and plan for the longer term future. Manage short, manage long. And there were, there were great organizations in our industry that had been doing that for a number of years mm -hmm. who really reaped the benefits when the Absolutely. transition happened. Absolutely. Great point. Fun. Yeah, I, I would say reimagine what's possible. I mean, it, challenge your vendors, challenge your partners, challenge the technology makers to continue to innovate with you. Um, you know, our best learnings come from our customers. And when customers have demands that maybe we don't necessarily have the exact product or exact solution, um, challenge us to continue to grow and, and yeah. continue to invest and continue to innovate our products to serve you. I mean, that's, that's what we're here for. Okay. Yeah, <coughs> completely agree. I, I would uh, have said something similar that uh, let's, uh, the, the pandemic has taught us that, uh, showed us uh, that there is technology out there and we are technology vendors that are inno innovating, but we want to do this together with our customers. Yeah. So there to try, there to challenge us, mm -hmm. there to test our, our staff and let's d develop t together. That's to the customers, the message to the customers, and then to the other technology vendors uh, sitting here, uh, be much more open for cooperation because yeah. that, I think that's the future of, uh, of uh, this industry. I completely agree. I think openness is the key. I'll, I'll add one thing. I often, it's the last day I get to speak by my people. I think the thing I would say to people is be honest. And I mean that in, the, in its most brutal sense. Be honest with your staff about what the situation is. Be honest with your clients and customers about what degradation of service is likely to happen and be upfront about it. I think there were instances where some suppliers and vendors were very honest and it, it, it maybe it was seen as a negative, but after one year in and 18 months in and two years in, the companies that were honest and upfront on day one, they were forgiven. The guys who weren't two years down the line, I think the grudges are, are held. But anyway, so that was a very good panel. Thank you for your, all of your honesty and candor. <laughs> let's welcome them, let's thank them all with a big round of applause. Thank you.